Hello and welcome to the Grove Church Podcast. I'm Charlie Lofton, the lead pastor there, and we are so glad that you're joining us. Whether you are a member and you're just catching up on a sermon that you missed or you're someone who's brand new, we are really glad that you are joining us. And if you are new in some way, and I know that a lot of people will do that, will listen to sermons first before they visit, I want you to know that we would love to meet you at any point. You can join us live in our services on Sunday, 9 and 1030, or our streaming service at 1030. Either way, we would love to be able to get to know you. And regardless of why you are here uh, listening to this sermon today, thank you so much for joining us. All right. Well, hey, good morning. If uh, this is your first time with us or if I haven't met you before, my name is Mark. Uh, I'm executive pastor here. would love to meet you out in the lobby or something. If uh, if you have been around here, you may, I might also say, hey, I'm Mark. You probably had, had, a lot, had some questions that haven't been around the last few weeks. Uh, pretty incredible uh, policy uh, at the Grove Church when somebody, pastoral staff, is on staff for 10 years that they get a, a sabbatical, which uh, in 25 years of of being in vocational type ministry. Uh, I'd never been with an organization or a church long enough to hit whatever that policy number was. And uh, man, I just want to say thanks to Grove leadership. They pretty much, uh, Charlie was like, this is going to happen. And uh, and so didn't really know what to expect from that. But uh, last few weeks have just been a really, a really rich time uh, with some space from my heart. And uh, and so now for the next three weeks, uh, I get to talk about the Ten Commandments. And uh, the, the one we're going to talk about two weeks from now is the Sabbath. So I think uh, there's going to be some of those things that God really might have for you that he's been communicating and, and doing in my own heart. So just excited to, to be back with you. Uh, it's, been a, it's been a really rich time. Um, hey, before I get too far, we... Uh, you may not know our student ministry just got back from Camp Barnabas, which is just one of the things for me that um, is just really, really cool. Uh, our, our student ministry is a part of serving at this special this camp for kids with special needs, and uh, it's a really tough, difficult week all the, every time they go, um, but very rewarding and just incredible and. Um, and so anyway, just if you see some of our students, if you get a chance to talk to Matt and kind of, if you don't know much about that or find out about their week, I would encourage you to ask um, because it's pretty incredible what God is, has used them and what he's using that camp to do. Uh, also, we, we saw our Cuba team uh, with Filter of Hope off last week. Uh, they actually left and uh, had some, some flight troubles, but they are in country now and um, Tell you what, would y'all mind, can I just pray for them real quick? I ask you to continue to pray for them this week, but can I, can I say a quick prayer for them together? Father, we just with one voice want to, uh, to bring our, our team uh, to you and uh, pray your blessing upon them. Pray your protection over them from the elements, from any harm. Um, Father, I pray that you would fill them up, even in the heat, uh, that you would fill them up with strength and energy and uh, Father, you would give them favor with the people that they interact with and the ability both to give this very practical thing of, of help with water, with clean water, but then also um, give them the, the ability to, to communicate your great big love for them and the good news that, that is in Jesus. And so, Father, we pray that you bless them. We pray that you would bring them back to our minds often, uh, that they would just feel your presence and your peace. And uh, Father, we're excited about what all you're going to do. To your glory. Amen. Uh, also, it's Father's Day at the Grove. Uh, I know that that is, you know, I mean, it's a day that's to be celebrated. And also, there's a lot of mixed emotions and everybody's, you know, got a different story. And so whether this day means God just bringing a lot of peace into your day or celebrating your father big, I just, uh, man, I hope that it's and pray that it's all of that. Uh, you know, we don't, if you've been around here for a, while, for a while, you've probably picked up that we don't really like Plan Father's Day sermon. Uh, so we're talking about <laughs> don't worship idols today. Uh, welcome to the Grove on Father's Day. But uh, but you know the more that I've that I've thought about it, and I, I've had more time than normal to kind of to work through and think through these things over these last few weeks. Um, you know this <laughs> it really does go to, together well because. This moment where God is, is giving Israel these Ten Commandments and establishing kind of what this, this love relationship and this connection looks like and what he is expecting from them, 
it feels like so much at the core of what that is, is this desire and invitation to, to just trust him, to trust him really big. And, uh, you know, I've uh, got four kiddos, uh, one that's, that's married and out of the house, three that are still at home. And, um, and I just through the years have picked up, mainly because it's the thing that, that uh, bothers me the most or frustrates me the most. Uh, when I see that my, my kids, that my family, uh, something happens and it, it feels to me like they lack trust or they, they worry that I'm not going to protect or they, they show some form of worry that I'm not going to provide or that, that maybe I'm not going to be there or faithful when they need me. Um, and I'm, I'm weird like this. You know, I, I, my emotions are, it's pretty, sometimes they can get hit pretty easily. And usually the way it's funny, usually the way it hits is um, I'm, fixing dinner, you know, and I'm promising this good dinner that they'll get fed. And my boy, Jack, man, he, he just, he just eats all the time. And, uh, so, you know, he'll ask, he'll ask me, when are we going to eat? And, uh, I said, I'm, I'm, I'm going to take care of you. He's like, what are we, what are we going to eat? My patent answer is something good. And he don't like that answer. That, that answer doesn't satisfy him. Something good. And I'm fixing it and you can trust. And what I want is I want him just to, to rest and to know Good food is going to be on the table, and it's, it's going to happen, and I can trust Dad. But two, two minutes later, hey, Dad, I'm hungry. My, my, what does he call his belly? He's got a new name for his belly. Harold, I think. <laughs> is Harold saying we need something? It's not, it's not happening fast enough. Uh, and it's, it's things like that where I'm like, man, if you, if you would just trust, I promise. I promise Daddy's going to, going to do that. And really, it feels like the... That I've seen the role of a father, this, this uh, good <laughs> but heavy burden of provision, of protection, of love. In fact, our, our oldest, there, there came this moment where it was obvious uh, that, man, he was, he was ready and he was wanting to step out on his own and felt like a really important moment. And so we planned this dinner together to, to talk about this transition and this kind of this new season of, of our lives and relationship. And um, I wanted to bring some kind of significance to it. And uh, I passed by this building site and there were some big rocks laid out there. So I got these three big rocks and on one of them I wrote uh, protection and on one of them I wrote provision and on one of them I wrote love. And then at, at dinner, we sat down there together and we talked about how, man, I, I, we as parents have, have felt this. I mean, this, this child, you know, we, we want to protect. It's uh, daddy's job. I want to protect you. And I want to make sure that you have all the things that you need and you never are wanting or wondering or, or stressing about it. And I want to make you <laughs> always know and have full confidence that you are loved big. And, uh, I slid protection across the table and I slid provision across the table because he was, you know, uh, but I pulled love back. So this one's never going anywhere. This one, this one's in our bedroom. This one, this one stays with us. We're always going to, but, but man, you are like, you know, as, as we get older and we start to step out on his own and into manhood, he's, he's taking those things. And this is the thing that what it looks like for this God to be trusted that that he can be trusted to protect us, that he can be trusted to provide for us, that we can rest in his love. And so these, these Ten Commandments, as he starts to walk through them, you start to see I mean, he's calling us to that. In fact, um, in Matthew 22, you know, we, we actually did a series on this not too long ago. I think Charlie mentioned it a couple of weeks ago again. When Jesus is asked what the, what the, the biggest, the most important of the commandments is, he, he says to love God and, and then to love your neighbor. And there's this, this vertical love between us and God. And there's this horizontal, like how we interact with, with one another. And you also see that. I mean, from, he's, it's the fulfillment, it's kind of the summation of the Ten Commandments because these early commands, there is this us and God relationship, you know. Uh, you shall have no other gods before me. You shall not worship any idols. You don't take my name in vain. You honor the Sabbath day. And then we start talking about, hey, man, don't murder folks. Don't commit adultery. Don't lie. We start talking about these, these horizontal relationships with others that are around us. And both of those are present. So these first few weeks, we really are looking at this, what is the, the thing that, that God is calling us to here? What are the things that he's saying are really important as we as we have this relationship with God, as Israel has this relationship with God. So 
Um, this is the second. We're going to start in Exodus 20, verse 4. And this is, this is how it's worded. It says, you shall, have, uh, you shall not make for yourself a carved image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is uh, in, the, in the earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth. You shall not bow down to them or serve them. For I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children to the third and fourth generation of those who hate me, but showing steadfast love to thousands of those who love me and who keep my commandments. So we're just going to walk through here, pick, make, make a few observations and pick some things apart here and ask what I think are some really big questions. The first thing that just automatically sticks out to me, make, make for yourself. It doesn't feel like we should have to be told that, that Israel should have to be, be told that. Don't. So I made you, God, I mean, I made, I made everything. Hey, y'all don't make for yourself. Don't take the position of creator and make for yourself something and then give your worship to that thing. I mean, just on, on the front at a base level, right? That, that just sounds ridiculous. This is, you know, when I've uh, kind of worked through myself or talked to others about the Ten Commandments, this is usually the one that are people like, well, that, I've never done that. I mean, I know there are places in the world where people do that, where people fashion idols and give their worship to them. I know that, you know, man, the, the Greeks or, man, you know, uh, when, when Israel's coming out of Egypt, they saw and were, you know, part, but, the, but, but that was, I mean, the, why, would you, why would you even do that? It seems like it shouldn't even need to be said, like, oh, of course not. Of course I wouldn't do that. So why do we make idols is kind of the first question I, I see. And I say we because, yes, this command to Israel, but you'll see, the more I think about it and the more I've looked at it, I mean, we, why do, why do we have a tendency to do something that does really seem ridiculous? I think we get a glimpse in Exodus 32, because the people, just after this, while, uh, while Moses is, is receiving the Ten Commandments, the people begin to get impatient, waiting on him to return from the mountain. And they say, the man who brought us out of the land of Egypt. So first off, they're impatient and worried because Moses isn't there. And they say, the man who brought us out of Egypt. Y'all see, that's problematic, right? Because Moses, if you know the story, I mean, Moses was used of God to, to bring them out of Egypt, but God clearly brought them out of Egypt. But they have put their focus on this person, Moses, and he's not with them at the moment. And since he's not with them at the moment, they're beginning to get impatient and worried and, and afraid. Uh, we don't know what's become of him. So what do you do? Well, they gathered all their gold jewelry together, and they fashioned it into a, the shape of a calf, a golden calf. And they began to give their worship to that. Does that seem weird? Like, oh, that, that's going to solve the problem? Well, what problem does it solve? There's something comforting about having something that you can see and that you can look at and that's close to you and that's tangible that you can touch. There is something comforting to that, and we all know it's true. You know, all of our kids uh, have had some, they've had stuffed animals, but there's always been that, that stuffed animal for each one of them. Uh, called the, we call it the lovey. I don't know what y'all called it in your house, but they've all had, they've all ha had a lovey. And man, these loveys, you know, I mean, they're all powerful and important. I mean, you, you lose the lovey, it's like, man, the end of the world has come. I have chased down loveys all over the place uh, with the twins. One Friday night, I, I was pushing them in the stroller, and we lived near the high school football field. And so we, I was just pushing them and, and taking circles around the football field during the game. And we got back home, and it was time to go to night-night. And guess what? There was no lovey. One of them had dropped it out of the side of their stroller somewhere on our walk. Well, guess what? There's no night-night with no lovey. Because night-night gives comfort, a tangible thing that they can hold on to while they're falling asleep. And so mama says to daddy, well, we got to have lovey. 
So guess what daddy spends the rest of the night doing? Walk in the football field to go find Lovey until we finally found him. And it took me quite a few laps to get back and find the place where Lovey was dropped and to bring Lovey home. Another time, I think this was with Brennan, uh, our 18 year old man, we lost it and we didn't know where it was. And so I tried to replace it. And if you've ever tried to do that, if you try to go to the store and buy Lovey like Lovey and replace it and, and like they're not going to notice, oh, they know. Oh, yeah, they know. This is, this is not Lovey and it just doesn't work. It's pointless to even make the attempt. But what is it about that? It's like, well, it's, it's comforting, especially at nighttime where you're not right with mom and dad to have this thing, this thing that you hold on to that you can touch that's tangible for you. And that seems weird, like that's the, yeah, this little kid stuff. But that's exactly what we do. Uh, I also remember, and I don't remember where I got this, and there's a lot of, we could have a lot of discussion about where our, you know, symbols of faith work into this idea of idol worship, what is and what isn't. But um, I think maybe at Silver Dollar City, early in my days of faith, um, I, or some convenience store, I got this little plastic frame that had a picture, you know, that, that picture, <laughs> you've seen it, the picture of Jesus. Uh, I don't know that Jesus looked anything like that, but that's what this little, this little picture. And I remember, like, it was always by my bed at night. Anytime I, we went anywhere, I, I brought it with me. One time I forgot it and I was, I had trouble sleeping because I was afraid because I had started to associate this picture with Jesus. And if I don't have this picture, then is Jesus present? Because somehow he's with this picture, which is broken. But that's what we do. But that symbol brought comfort because it was something I could, I could touch and see. And so we do this. We do this in all sorts of ways. And again, I mean, I've seen it in the world. It really uh, became apparent to me when I began to travel and we spent time in India, because of course, India is one of those places where people really do. I mean, everywhere you go, there is an idol, literally everywhere. If you're in somebody's house, it's in the corner. If you're doing business and you're in somebody's office, it's right beside their desk. Um, there, a lot of times there's a huge or a little temple set up outside that's got all the idols there. If you pass by a tree, there'll be an idol set up by that tree. If you pass by a river, I mean, it, it, is, it is. It is everywhere. And, uh, and most of the time, those idols represent certain things. And so like if it's, a, uh, if it's the God of powerful destruction, uh, there's this diva that they give that I attribute those things to. And she usually has a, a necklace of human skulls and, and blood dripping down the side of her mouth um, and a huge sword in her hand. And that's to attribute, okay, God is, can bring destruction and should be feared. Uh, if it's a God of money, you know, there are these different symbols. Um, there's one uh, I had this crazy night, which I've, I've talked about before, uh, at, in the city that worships this, this deity named Shiva, and it's called the Night of Shiva, and uh, all kinds of craziness around that. But uh, at 5 a.m. the next morning, the, the friend that I was with, we got up, we went to the temple that's to Shiva, and he was going to give his worship there. And there they had an idol that I had never seen before. It wasn't the, the shape of a person. I had seen uh, idols, the shape of or the likeness of what they call Shiva. Um, but I had never seen this. It was just this kind of weird shape. So I'm like, what, what is, what is, what is the shape? I don't even, can't even recognize what this is. And he said, well, that's actually uh, the inside of the female body at the moment of conception. Oh, that's weird. At the same time, if you're looking for something to give your worship to, and you're talking about the moment that life is conceived, then you go, okay, this is what I give worship to. That's the reason the, the cow is worshipped. That's the reason the river is worshipped. These are all places that, that you could attribute. Maybe life came from here. But here's the deal. It's all so belittling and limiting to the creator God. Exodus 19, uh, verse 5, this is just before the Ten Commandments. God says this, If you will indeed obey my voice and keep my covenant, you shall be my treasured possession among all peoples. Y'all, just, just, just hear that. This, this desire that God has before he gives these commands, this relationship that he desires, that this, that this people, that his people would be his, his treasured possession possession, this special, special relationship among all the peoples. And then he says, 
for all the earth is mine. That's the reality. <laughs> it's, he's, so much, he's so much bigger. Yes, is, is he in the ocean? Yes, is he in the river? Yes, is he in the, is he in the tree? Yes, is he creator? He's, he's, he's so much bigger than that. And so anytime we, we try to do something and try to make something, we belittle him. Isn't it right that at some point we should graduate from the loveys, from the things that require that, that our faith is strong enough that we're, we're able to see above that, that he's so much, he's so much bigger than that? Uh, we were out of town last week, and the, the twins were staying with my parents. And uh, when we went to pick them up, uh, Jack was walking out, and he said, oh, I forgot my lovey. And I heard my dad say, you don't need that anymore. And Jack looked back and said, yes, I do. <laughs> He hadn't quite graduated from the need for that tangible thing to hold on to, to be able to sleep well. But as we grow in our faith, shouldn't we get to the point that we're like, we don't need that because we, we see him in everything. Um, instead, instead of belittling God into something we can manage, what if we embraced his enormity? Uh, last week, uh, Terry and I got the chance to celebrate our 27th wedding anniversary. Uh, we took a little trip and we were by the beach and the birds at the ocean always, they just always are amazing to me. But I think this time more than ever, I just, I sat there and watched this certain type of bird that was there. And there was a guy there that knew more about it than me. I don't know the name of the bird. I don't know any of the details, but I was still just amazed, but just watching them. Uh, because we would watch them for a long time. And they would never flap a wing. And he was talking about how, yeah, I mean, they just get in that position and then they can stand up there for hours. And the whole time I watched, like, like there was this whole bunch of them and none of them were flapping any wings. None of them were flapping any wings. What were they doing? The powerful wind coming in from the ocean, they were just positioning themselves in a way that they could just let that power lift them and hold them in that place. I wanted so bad to be one of those birds. Uh, Terry and I were just sitting there talking about it. Man, wouldn't that be nice? I mean, but what they had done, they had figured out how to do that. And when I look at that, our creator, God, he, yeah, he, he did that. <laughs> but he's not just, he didn't just create the bird. He, like, you yeah, have the wind, the, the power of the wind that I can't even see that's holding them in place. Like, that's, that's my, oh, yeah, the sound of the ocean and the, and the current and the way that all that works, you know, and gravity and, and th that I'm still holding, and then I got, oh, I got oxygen. I'm breathing. Like, like, how belittling is it to then take that massive creator God and then try to put it in anything and give his attention that he deserves and his trust that he deserves to anything else? Anything would be smaller, anything smaller than his, than his enormity and how huge and big and incredible he is. So why does it matter to God? I guess this is my second question. Why does, why does it matter to him? You know, it says here, for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God. And um, Charlie talked about this a little bit, so I won't spend a lot of time here. But I just want to say, it, it, jealous, it's not jealous of it's not some little kid that's jealous of somebody who's took something from him. It's, 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 it's a jealous for. God desires to have this relationship with us, and it's rightfully so. These, these commitments that he's calling us to are, are special, and, and he has made them to us. Um, you know, I talking about our anniversary, and also a few weeks ago, we were, Terry and I were at a wedding, and I um, started thinking about how significant it is to be in front of people that you love and trust and who love you and making that, that marriage commitment to them. In fact, I, I, uh, the few weddings that I've officiated, I've, even in, in my Bible, I've got the, the vows that I would walk couples through, you know? I mean, these are significant things that they say to one another, to have and to hold from this day forward. I pledge before God and these witnesses to place your good above mine, now and always, no matter the circumstances. I promise to honor you, to love you, and to cherish you until death do us part, joyfully and willing. I commit myself to you and to you alone. I mean, those are they're not flippant commitments. It's a it's a declaration of my, my promise of fidelity. And, you know, the longer that we're married, the more I realize everything else 
good about our relationship and our family is built on that trust, on these, these things that we've committed to one another, and that I don't second guess whether she loves me today or whether I'm going to be faithful to her tomorrow. If that's eroded, then there's nothing left. And God calls us to have eyes only for him. Um, you know, my, my Hindu friends have often asked me and when I've been in those places to worship the idol with them. There's a lot of different ways that they do that. But I've been in a lot of those worship ceremonies or services or temples. And, you know, I'll, I'll stand at the side and be respectful and watch and, and try to learn kind of what's what they're believing, what's going on in their heart. Uh, but when asked to join in, I'm always like, man, I just can't, I can't, I can't do that. And uh, my answer has always been, and it's been clarifying for me in my personal faith, and I think also for them, I'll compare it to the marriage relationship. I'll say, you know, man, you know me well enough to know how much I love my wife. And have you ever second guessed? Well, is Mark, Mark's going to talk to a different lady today, or Mark's got eyes for this other woman. You know, you know that's not going to happen, right? I know. I know how much you love her. Well, you've also heard me talk about my faith in Jesus and what he means to me, right? Yeah. Well, I can't give his I can't give his love to another. I can't step up there and, and give his worship that he, he's everything for. I can't give that to, to this, this deity. I can't, I can't do that because he has all of my heart. It matters to God because to do that would be a, a break of trust and the worship that he alone deserves. So my last question, what, what would an idol free life look like? What would that actually look like? You know, I feel like we continually fight, like I was saying a second ago, to the battle to feed our kids good food. Uh, you know, they get home from school. They ate early in the day. They're, they're, they're hungry. Uh, daddy's planning a good, good meal. And, you know, I'll say, you know, it's going it's to be something good. Jack doesn't necessarily believe that. Uh, believe me. And so they'll hit the, the cabinet and try to eat some snacks. Because just like Israel got impatient and went to the golden calf, <laughs> they get impatient and go to the Twinkie box, right? Uh, it's really, really frustrating, you know? Because I know, we know, if they'll just wait a little bit, they'll have the appetite for the really good stuff that God is promising and calling us to. But we'll, we'll get impatient, and so we'll take the shortcut and, and give his attention, give, give our trust to something that's not worthy of it that doesn't fulfill. And, uh, and then we find out, oh man, that, that doesn't really work. We settle for some weak substitute and forfeit the abundant life that he's called us to. We'll give that trust and attention to a person, to an organization, to a bank account, to a job, to some drug, to some hobby, <laughs> to some other thing, believing that it might give us peace. And maybe it, it plays it for a moment, but then it doesn't fulfill. That trust is it's not worthy to hold that, that amount of trust, that amount of love. And so then ultimately it falls apart. And the craziest thing I've, this is personal confession, the craziest thing about us is that when then we'll turn around and blame him because where is the life to the fullest? Where did it go, God? Why don't I have the life that you promised? And then if I look down at, at where I've given my devotion, where I've given my time, my energy, my money, my, my trust, where I'm hoping to find peace, I've, I've forfeited this relationship and I've gone to some weak substitute. You know, I think God gets the blame for a lot of things <laughs> when really he's just, he's just called us this, this beautiful Ten Commandments, you know, uh, I think, I think growing up, I think the nature is when you see a list of rules, you go, man, man, I, I don't, rules, why they got to be rules? <laughs> well, man, in this kind of covenant relationship that God is calling his people to, yeah, it's really important. It's really important that we look to him. It's really important that it's built on trust. He is faithful in calling us to, to trust in his faithfulness. Um, you know, that, that section in the middle, uh, visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children to the third and fourth generation of those who hate me. 
You know, we'll immediately go, man, the consequences of this are big, and that's, that's scary. <laughs> but if you look at that full sentence, that's true. But do you catch that it's a contrast? He says, but this God is showing steadfast love, faithful love to thousands of those who love me and keep my commandments. It's also this beautiful invitation to this incredible relationship with God to thousands. <laughs> a lot of times we miss the second part of that. You know, on this, on this little trip, uh, Terry and I snorkeled for the first time. I had a little, I did that one time a little bit, but I found out once we got the, the goggles on and the snorkel that Terry had never really had those, anything like that on before, especially in the ocean. And, um, you know, we'd sit there for several days looking at the surface of the water. And now all of a sudden we we stuck our faces below the surface and it was teeming with life and all these different types of fish and coral and things, things I had never seen before. You know, I've seen National Geographic. Jack calls it the Yellow Square Channel. Uh, we watch the Yellow Square Channel some, uh, but I had never myself seen uh, a sea urchin or, or a stingray or these, th these things that we were looking at. And, um, uh, you know, I just think a lot of times it's like we we look at life and uh, yeah, we're just at this at this level, just just surface level. And this thing that God really desires, this relationship He really desires with us, man. When we go beneath the surface with Him, it is it is endless, <laughs> and it's so much bigger, and He's so much greater. But we just like to put Him in a box that we can control. You know, I think it's been rightly said that he, uh, he created us in his image and we decided we would, uh, we would return the favor. And so we try to shape God into an image we can control and that we can understand. And he just blows all that away. And if we embrace him for how big he is, man, the, the life he's called us to is possible. Uh, one last thought, uh, Exodus 32, you know, when, uh, when Moses returns to the people and he sees what they've done with this golden calf. You know what he does to it? He takes the golden calf, he burns it, he grinds it into powder, he scatters it on the water, and he makes the people of Israel drink it. You know where that golden calf ended up on their journey? In the porta potties that line the road. <laughs> where it should be. His devotion, given anything less than the fullness of who he is, is ridiculous and pointless and, and deserves nothing, nothing more than that. And so if, if it's cool with you guys, I just, I'd like to pray and pray specifically that, that God would identify for us what are those things that we're giving our attention to and that he would burn them and turn them to dust and remove them from our life. So we can really know what it means as, as a person, as a community, to, to be his treasured possession. Father, I, uh, I ask you that that would be true. I, I confess there are just things that get my attention, and uh, there are moments of weakness in my faith that uh, I feel like you've abandoned me, and I go looking for um, what might fulfill that moment, what might give me peace in the moment, what might provide for me in the moment, what might give me pr protection in the moment. And uh, Father, I just know that all along, they're all just, just weak substitutes, and you are the only one. Uh, Father, you deserve the worship. You're calling us to it. This relationship, this sweet thing as a, as a person, as an individual, as a, as a community. And uh, Father, I ask that you would continually put your finger on the, the lesser things that have our eyes and our hearts and draw us uh, to fidelity in this love relationship with you. Amen. Thanks again for joining us on our sermon podcast. And you can learn more about us at thegrovechurch.org. 
And if you go to thegrovechurch.org slash connect, there's a form you could fill out. Just let us know that you've been listening. And if you want to dig deeper on some of these topics that we cover on our sermon podcast or just in other issues of dealing with culture or theology, those kinds of things, uh, you can check out our Cultivate podcast, which is on the same feed, um, however you found this particular podcast. So again, this is Charlie, the lead pastor at The Grove, and thank you so much for joining us.